This game is rated M and is intended for mature audiences. Well, maybe Yamachi don't want you spying on him. What a chad. Who cares? <laughs> Bro, you just gonna stop talking to Firenze just because Yumiko's in the room? You're a dipwad too. Uh, what? Another person exists? It would have been much easier if they'd simply treated me like I didn't exist. Their clumsy method of ignoring me could sometimes become a weapon as sharp as any insult. I was well past the point of letting each and every sudden silence weigh on my mind, but it still wasn't exactly a pleasant feeling. Yes. Bruh! You know, middle schoolers suck. The more I tried to ignore them, the more their whispers seemed to pierce their way into my ears. A year had passed since I'd first set foot into the school. By then, there wasn't a single person in my class who didn't know all about my family. There's no such thing as privacy in the countryside. The real nature of my mother's illness, which should have been kept absolutely confidential by the hospital, had filtered all the way down to middle schoolers' gossip. A purely academic question occurred to me. If this wasn't despair, then what exactly would qualify? <laughs> I opened my sketchbook beneath my desk, making sure that nobody could see. I kept at my art, and flipping for the book, it was obvious that my ability to depict fine details had come a long way in the last year. But all that really proved was how obsessively I'd sought escape, how deeply detached I'd grown from the world around me. Rather than pride, I felt something like nausea. Even my art was beginning to lose its value as a refuge. The room was pure white. Nothing had changed here. Not the room, not even my mother's posture in her bed. It was as if she if, it was as if I'd never left. Every time I walked in that door and saw her sitting there, I felt a sudden surge of irrepressible pity run through me. As always, I saw my mother in profile. As always, her gaze didn't turn to me. As always, she smiled quietly. But there was no tenderness in that expression. She was simply moving her face into that shape. It was an empty imitation of a real smile. Uh, Wild Card is playing Mirror's Edge Catalyst. Cool. I lowered a small bundle of books and weekly magazines my mother had requested onto the shelf beside her bed. They usually came in the mail, but sometimes I happened to run into a nurse who would hand them over to me for a more personal delivery. I I know that he's playing. You don't have to say that more than once. Of course, the weeklies in question were respectable, established publications that largely kept away from the scandals and rumors circulated by the tabloids. We couldn't take the risk of her reading something like that article I'd unwittingly con contributed to the previous winter. It undoubtedly would have set her ba back her treatment, which was already proceeding slowly enough. <laughs> Hi, Goris. Yeah, uh, I, I have started on Yumiko's route. I don't know exactly how long, how, how far alone in the route I am, but we're in her main flashback, so we've got to at least be a decent ways through it. Yeah, that's fine. I'll, I try to stream Grisea on weekends, so usually Saturday, and if I can't do Saturday, then it'll be Sunday. My mother's newfound reading habits seemed to be part of an attempt to learn more about my father and the company he was running. Looking at that thick pile of magazines and books, I felt my chest tighten at her obvious desperation. Mom had never known much about the business. I would have been surprised if she could understand half of what she was reading. I would say four weeks is a low ball for the amount of time it'll take to finish this. The roots in this VN have been very long up this, to this point. Our interactions follow the same familiar pattern. I chattered away relentlessly, while my mother muttered vaguely. 
Lately, even those monosyllabic responses had grown repetitive and careless. Almost as if she was beginning to treat the world with the same careless disinterest my father had shown her. It was a particularly difficult visit. My mother barely spoke, and I ran out of things to say fairly quickly. As the hours I spent at school had grown increasingly suffocating, I was spending more and more time wandering around in search of quiet places where I could be alone. These days I frequently found myself lacking for stories to tell. I rose quietly from my seat. My mother's face, as always, didn't turn to me. It had been a truly pathetic excuse for a conversation, and I had little hope tomorrow would be any better. Amine's route is 80% flashback. Really? I feel like people are really trying to convince me to give Amine's route a try. I don't think that's going to happen, but that is interesting. And what's weird is, like, I already know at least a little bit about Amine's backstory. They mentioned it in, like, the prologue where she got into a bus crash. So, that would be... Hmm. I, I appreciate people trying to encourage me to give it a try, but I I really don't see that happening. Time no longer seemed to be flowing. It was a stagnant, brackish pool, and even treading water was becoming a struggle. That's not... No, I don't count that as a spoiler. If you're, spo if you're gonna reveal plot points, then that would be a spoiler, and I say, do not do that. But as, as I was prepared to leave, my mother spoke. That hadn't happened for quite some time. That one word came as a complete surprise. Was she about to say something? Despite it all, I found myself pausing expectantly, hoping for some positive sign. Thinking the matter over calmly, it was foolish to even imagine her mood had suddenly changed. But I was so starved for a glimmer of hope that my mind latched onto the most optimistic possible interpretation. And then, with a few simple words, my naive happy end scenario shattered like the fragile pieces of glass that it had always been. Oof. My mother had never said anything like that before. No doubt she thought that, no doubt the thought had crossed her mind, but so long as she had even a shred of rationality remaining, the words could never have passed her lips. After all, if she were to say that, then nothing could ever change, except to fall apart. Oh, we get epic music now. Oh, this is not good. Something slipped out of my hands and clattered to the floor. A visitor from the company had dropped off a few jelly desserts. I'd been taking one from the shelf with a spoon. My mother had been skipping her meals lately, but I thought she might at least manage to eat that. Considering the season, a white peach jelly seemed appropriate. Maybe it would be easier for her to hold with a spoon with the flat handle? Moments before, those were my only thoughts in my mind. They were gone now. Obliterated by my mother's words so completely that it was as if they'd never existed. I ran as fast as I could, pushing my heart so hard I thought it just might sputter to a stop. Down the slope in front of the hospital. Up again. Onto a large curving detour past the station, around the corner of a small cleaning store, into the remains of an abandoned factory. Only then, absolutely confident that I was alone, did I finally come to a halt. Gasping for air, I doubled over and held my trembling legs with both hands, propping up a body that seemed ready to co collapse. The world flickered before my oxygen-starved eyes. My peripheral vision was dim and clouded, as though I was peering out from inside a tunnel. <laughs> I could feel sweat pouring down from all over my body. My hair and my clothes were completely disheveled. I'd fallen at some point on the way over. There were scrapes on my knee and elbow. I pushed myself erect, a tattered mess of a girl. But I couldn't have cared less about any of that. After all, the tears streaming uncontrollably down my face were far more blatantly pathetic than my beat-up clothing. Well, the VA really did a good job of getting the in unintelligible blubbering down. Good lord. 
Like, I'm, that's not an insult, that's a compliment. I could have endured it if she had complained about something I could fix. I could have behaved better. There was still room for my grades to improve. I could have made myself more presentable. I could have cut every strand of hair to the exact same length. I could have learned to walk in a refined way, at an absolutely steady pace. But no matter what, I was powerless to undo the reality of my own birth. Why did she have to choose the one thing I could never, ever change? My grandparents were right back then. If it was possible, she should have just tried again. No! No! She should have crushed that egg in the womb and pretended it never happened. No! Better that than hopelessness. This irreparably broken life. Placing my hands against my breast, I pushed them down with all my strength. Oof! This is getting rough. How could such a thing t so totally beyond my control bring me such misery? I felt a dull, throbbing pain inside my chest. The painful pressure was accompanied by a slight twinge of stimulation. Even as I rejected it, my body reminded me that I was a female. Oof. This is... this is sad to read through. There was pain, but at the same time I could feel the blood throughout my body beginning to stir in an unfamiliar way. Instinctively, I knew that it was something sexual, and I shivered with pure loathing. I hated my body. I hated the woman it was becoming. This is getting pretty uncomfortable to read. I didn't ask for that misery. I had no say in my crime. I was born with me. It was born with me. I was born with myself! That's that's what she's saying. But so long as I lived, the pain would always be lurking somewhere deep inside me. If only you'd been a boy. With one phrase, anyone could reduce me to nothing. I could study all I wanted. I could be the sweetest, most well-behaved person in the world. But so long as I stayed in th that body, my naked vulnerability would never go away. <laughs> I threw open my bag and took my, out my pencil box. Flipping open the lid, I retrieved the box cutter I used as a makeshift sharpener for my colored pencils. Oh! Origin of the box cutter! I wonder when exactly I began to find the act of cutting things apart pleasant. Uh-oh. Oh, this might get real bad. The clicking of the blade emerging from its sheath. The sound of something once whole being severed apart. Those had become calming sounds to me. How wonderful would it be if I could slice away my femininity with a single box cut? Oh, oh, oh. This might get real bad. Okay, I... I might have to black out the screen if necessary. How wonderful would it be if I could sever my fate with a touch of the blade? How wonderful would it be if one movement of my hand could cut me free of all the troubles that coil around me and choke the air from my lungs. As I cut savagely through the long, identical bundles of black, such thoughts ran through my head one after another. Okay, she's just cutting her hair. Still very sad, but I thought she was going in a different direction than that. Yeah, I thought that was going to go in a different direction. But, thank goodness it was just the hair. <laughs> She's getting the important Mulan haircut, guys. It's it's epic. On the boiling concrete, speckled with the remnants of faded black, clumps of black gathered. They fell like a vile rain until the sun-heated ground was covered in them. I could feel the gloom in my heart fading as I looked down into the darkness. But in its place, that dirty blackness left a layer of filth inside me that could never be cleaned away. Oh no, not classmate A. He's a tool. Oh no, not classmate B. He's a lunkhead. <laughs> She's just like bald now. It's the new craze. Everybody's doing it. Just gotta be a man. <laughs> what, are you jealous? If you want, I could cut your hair too. 
Oh, we got a new character on the scene, Classmate D. As you all know, Classmate D is one of the most well-written characters in the whole visual novel. Sunohara, is that you? <laughs> you sound like Sunohara. <laughs> wow. Oh, it's so funny because they don't have money. Isn't that a funny joke? <laughs> Apparently they actually do think so. When I showed up for school with a hairstyle more appropriate for a boy, my classmates' reaction was exactly what I expected. They made no effort to hide their amusement. I'd gotten that far uneventfully, not giving them much thought to work with. Not, got, not giving them much to work with, so perhaps this was a bit of a recoil effect. Whatever the case, my rough bob cut became an easy target for mockery and speculation. Of course, there wasn't a single person there who showed any concern for me. Then <sighs> Grandma's like, what the heck happened? My grandmother was simply lost for words at first. <laughs> you know, that wasn't very funny. Well, that, again, is a quote that accurately describes most of this visual novel. Not that the aghast expression on her face meant she was worried about me. I understand nothing. The one and only thing she was concerned about was how poorly my actions would appear in the eyes of society. Grandma, why are you talking to yourself? Oh! <laughs> My grandmother, muttering about shame and humiliation, averted her eyes and disappeared inside the house. And for a very long time, I sat alone in my room, utterly silent except for the voices of the cicadas. At least we'll always have the beeping cicadas. Oh no, Toshe-san. If Toshe-san dies, that's going to be the saddest moment in the visual novel. F forget the cat dying. That'll be worse. Toshe-san was the only person who showed genuine concern for me. But it didn't make me feel any better to know I'd made this kind old woman worry. More than anything else, her sorrowful face made me regret my rashness. I'd gotten carried away by my emotions and lashed out, but nothing had changed. Nothing was going to change. For the sake of the one or two people who acknowledged my existence, I decided not to repeat my mistake. No! I just said the, the freaking thing! I, I, need, I need more water. trying to do this, you know? Oh man, all, I just, I sure hope that Toshe-san doesn't die. That would be sad. And then just look what happens. Literally the next page, she dies. I just, I don't, don't know why they do this. It's just, mm. It's almost like I'm getting too good at predicting what's going to happen in the story. Well... I'm getting eerily good at predicting what's going to happen in this story, so... Toshe-san's death came soon thereafter. As the record-setting heat wave stretched on, the news was constantly occupied with stories of elderly people succumbing to heat stroke. And one day, our neighbor, already past her 70th year, was among them. You, are you telling me I need to leave? How dare you? Oh no, is this going to be another case of everybody hates Yumiko? だから 
He just said he was going to the airport. Does, does daughter, another very well developed character, does daughter not understand that Yumiko wasn't the one who's like, hey, Toshe, work for free and without thanks. Do it, peon. I get that daughter is probably very sad that Toshe san died as well. But it's no excuse to act like a dip. Boy, That's not Sanai. No, no. Sanai san would never say anything like that. Either that or it's a different Sanai than the one from Clanad. There's no way Sanai Furukawa would say something like that, though. Mmm, belly. Your world is supposed to grow larger as you grow up. Mine only seemed to be shrinking ever smaller. I'd lost Toshe-san, and with her, the small place of refuge in front of our house door vanished as well. Just as I was on the verge of giving up, finally, at long last, a small ray of light broke through the wall of dark clouds. This is just... See, no, 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 here's what's gonna happen. They're gonna get our hopes up, be like, oh, your mom's feeling better, and then she dies. That's what's gonna happen. My mother was eating a mandarin orange served as a treat after her meal. Her expression was as placid as always. <laughs> <laughs> she stole Toshi Sad's life force. <laughs> but for once, she didn't. It didn't look like a mask she'd plastered onto her face. The peace in her eyes seemed real, something that had flowed naturally to the surface from deep inside her. Our retreat to the quiet of the countryside hadn't done much at first. If anything, our family tensions had probably taken a toll on my mother. But after many years of peace, it seemed her mind was slowly beginning to regain its equilibrium. The recent downturn had given way to weeks of, first, of steady improvement. What's going to happen if it turns out I'm right? Well, then uh, Yumiko will go insane, probably kill someone with a box cutter. Her dad will be like, oh, let's just sweep that under the rug. And then he builds a school so she can continue learning. So that, that that's what I'm guessing, because he mentioned before that it's like, oh... Yumiko had, like, a very serious episode, like, a couple years ago that we had to take care of. That's just what I'm guessing. <laughs> Again, I'm theorizing. I don't know for sure, but I'm getting pretty good at predicting what this game's gonna throw at me. <laughs> Once you can meet your own needs, it becomes possible to worry about the needs of others. Did I say meet or worry? I, I'll say, once you can meet your own needs, it becomes possible to worry about the needs of others. My mother had begun to give my questions real responses for the first time in years. We'd never been able to discuss her treatment, but lately it had become a safe topic of conversation. Specifically, her progress was so promising that a discharge from the hospital was coming into view at long last. おばあちゃんと一緒に先生にお話を聞くから、そこでいろいろと今後のことも聞いてくるわね。あと、ゆみ子。何お母さん、ゆみ子。あのね。ごめんね。お母さん、ひどいこと言って。あなたにこれだけ
The moment I closed the door behind me, the world began to shimmer through a wall of tears. At least it's happy crying for a change. I couldn't remember the last time my mother had showed that kind of concern for me. I don't know if she ever had. By the standard of a healthy parent-child relationship, I guess it was an insignificantly small thing. But for me at that moment, those tentative words of compassion were enough to inspire overwhelming happiness. Happiness so strong that I couldn't help but break down and sob. And then Yumiko's mom dies in three, two, one. Oh, maybe not. I spoke the words again and again, as if to fix the fact more firmly in reality. Perhaps Toshe-san had, had taken pity on me and stopped by to heal my mother on her way to heaven. Things were suddenly moving in such a positive direction that such thoughts seemed almost plausible. The next week, my grandmother and I went to meet with my mom's physician for an update on her condition. Normally, I was the only one who attended those meetings, but the progress was significant enough that he asked Grandma to come as well. Flipping through the papers in his hand, he gave us a detailed account on my mother's symptoms and current status. Why am I theorizing everybody dies? Uh, because I know this game. This game tries to be very, very dark and serious. And also, we've had mention of Yumiko's dad in the present. Zero mention of her mom. So I'm assuming, one way or another, her mom's not in the picture anymore in the present time frame. And again... This game is kind of trying to prey on your emotions a bit. So they, they, what they do, they give you some uplifting stuff, and then they take it away. That's what they did in Michiru's root. And Sachi's root as well. So I'm just assuming they're going to do it in this one as well. <sighs> Not that I'd really needed to hear any of this. I already knew she was recovering. For someone who'd visited her every single day for years, it was impossible to mix that trans miss the transformation. So, so did once the doctor's explanation came to an end, my mother, grandmother leaned forward, clinging to his arm as, he spo as she spoke. The moment those words left his mouth, my grandmother lowered her head so deeply I thought she might topple out of her chair and prostrate herself on the floor. Oh, that's what you're happy about. Yumiko's just like, really? Grandma continued to lavish her thanks on the doctor. As always, doing her best to pretend that I wasn't even in the room. Grandma's kind of a dip as well. Mom's return to her husband would ensure that the Kawamoto business would continue receiving support from the Sakaki family. It was blatantly obvious from my grandmother's words that it was her sole reason for her gratitude. To the woman who had brought her into the world, my mother was nothing but a defective political tool. But that only strengthened my determination to take care of her. I, again, cannot relate to this. Once the doctor's explanation was over, my grandmother went straight home without even stopping by to say, see her daughter's face. I heard her muttering the names of business partners to herself as she went. She was probably planning to hurry back to the house and inform them of the news. Grandma's just got very skewed priorities. Then again, I wasn't exactly eager to have her visit my mother with that sort of an attitude, so if anything, her quick departure was convenient. Dropping a pile of magazines and books onto the shelf as usual, I spoke to my mother in a tone of sincere cheerfulness. おばあちゃんやおじいちゃんに迷惑をかけることもなくなるのね。何より mother spoke those words with real remorse in her voice. But at that moment, the burden didn't seem so heavy. My mother's feelings were more than enough compensation. Just as requested, I pulled back the curtains from the window at Mom's side. Hallelujah! A vault of blue stretched out behind the panes of the glass. It was very picture. It was the very picture of a summer sky, compared to the heart of the city where the Sakaki House stood. The blue in that place seemed far more pure and vivid. 
<laughs> Yuji's like, look, I, uh, I don't want to rush you in this story, but, um, it's kind of midnight now, and we need to get back to school. I'm not done yet! <laughs> Toshi-san told me once that my mother had always enjoyed gazing at the sky. She didn't look for anything in particular, she just tilted her head back and watched. And when people asked her why, she could never find an answer. Memories from the day we first came to the town flashed into my mind. We'd walked hand in hand under a beautiful blue sky, but mother's dull, lifeless eyes had never left the path below our feet. But she had finally remembered the sky. That could only mean that she was on her way to recovery. It occurred to me that I didn't have a single memory of the two of us doing something like that, together. I found myself very much looking forward to the small event that would accompany my mother's discharge from the hospital.